Welcome to the How To Dad Podcast. My name is Devin Pierce. We are live on Mixer. It is August 7th, 2019. We had our episode last week on July 31st. And we discussed developmental milestones for children ages 5 to 9. Which is a, a generalized guide you guys can check out if you are interested in seeing how your kids compare to other children in the age bracket. Today's episode 19, and we are talking about eating together, which, by the way, I can't spell together without saying to get her in my head. You know, this has been my thing ever since somebody told me to use that to remember how to spell it. Never left my head. So guys, each week I bring you tips and tricks for parenting, adulting, and life as a whole, and share the tools from my toolbox with you to help make you better equipped for life's great adventure. The How To Dad podcast is owned and hosted by myself, Devin Pierce, and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0. International license has all rights reserved. Currently available for audio listeners on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. If there is another audio service you would like to have us on, let me know and I'll get it there for you. So today's introduction to eating as a family is provided by Alberta Milk, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I actually got this book which is our reference material from a cooking class that was offered here in town. And it's actually called Eat Together. At the back here, they also suggest if you'd like more nutrition or recipe information, visit moreaboutmilk.com or eat, or sorry, easytastyhealthy.ca. Haven't checked out the website to myself. Um, so let me know if you do. This is a topic I would like to get into more detail with in the future, uh, for another show, as it were, as I do know, I have somewhere some reference material that has, goes into more of the psychology behind eating together and the mental health benefits quite a bit more than this book does, although it does suggest them. I, however, have no idea where that reference material is or what it even was from. It's just a very vague memory. So when I find it, though, I'll have another episode to dig more deeply into this topic. So the real question is, folks, why should we be eating together as a family? Well, we're going to get into that. First off, we have five core values or benefits rather to eating together as a family. The first benefit is the nutritional value. There have been several studies done that have shown that eating as a family improves the variety of feed, feed, <laughs> the variety of food we eat. Kind of like having a gym buddy, uh, eating as a family gives us a level of accountability to each other, encouraging us to eat more balanced as well as maintaining a healthier weight level. Uh, when you're all working on it together, it's easier to encourage each other to achieve your goals of eating well and stuff. The second reason for maintaining the habit of eating as a family is simply family tradition. Family members who develop this tradition have a strong sense of belonging, which in turn generates good memories and tradition. These traditions then stay with our children for the rest of their lives, helping build strong family bonds and relationships, as well as setting them up to continue these positive habits going forward into adulthood. 
gathering around as a family is also an opportunity for communication, which may not always happen in other places. And that's how we strengthen and build those relationships amongst our family as well. The third benefit is simply doing better, whether it be in school or with general skill development. Uh, getting your children involved with meal preparation lends them important skills for the rest of their life, not just in cooking, but in general planning, organizing, and stuff like that as well. By getting them involved, you're also going to help them expand the types of food they are willing to eat or try. Basically, if they're preparing it, they have more of a comfort with it and will be more willing to try something new. Uh, we've already mentioned how communication there happens during a family meal and it's key to building those relationships. But it's also known that and provenly shown that children that experience these types of meal times are better communicators as an overall whole and can have less social problems um, because they know how to better interact with other people. A key part of that too is also making sure that you're utilizing teaching moments that are given to you while you're sitting at the family dinner in communication. What I mean like that is if there is a disagreement or an argument that occurs at your family dinner, dealing with it in a healthy, positive way and teaching those skills to your children. The final benefit of eating together as a family is financial. Um, saving a bit of money with the right type of planning for your meals. You know, that's something we all want to do. We all want to save money, right? An example of this is to say, cook an entire ham on Sunday, doing slices of ham as part of your meal, and then maybe making some thinner slices for sandwiches later in the week, or using cubes of ham tossed into a macaroni salad. So by buying uh, one with a bone in it, you can also use the bone in the extra bits for making a, something like a pea soup, if you're into that. And what you just have done there is you've bought a singular item, but by planning ahead, you could get three to even five meals out of that one piece of meat. And that can be way more cost effective than buying five different types of meat for different meals. I also understand that eating together may not be the most efficient way to get some things done. And I can tell you right now, I'm always guilty of coming up with excuses why I should be down here in the studio rather than sitting upstairs with my family. And nine times out of 10, my spouse probably argued less often. <laughs> I smarten up and I do stay upstairs, but sometimes it's hard to choose that higher road and we become so focused on other aspects of our lives that we're not realizing what we're missing out on. And it's important. So let's talk about breaking some of those barriers down and getting you focused on having family meals. I get it. We all have other commitments. And to simply be able to deal with those commitments, sometimes it's just as easy as being more flexible with mealtime. Whether it's having it before or after extracurricular activities for your children, or perhaps dinners just never work because of when a member is always working. That's fine. Maybe focus on having breakfast or lunch instead. If that's an option for you, Go ahead. You don't have to do three meals a day as a family. But try to do the ones you can as a family. A meal also doesn't have to be in the family home to be a family meal. As in a picnic and pack it all up with you. Take it with you to those extracurricular activities. And have it at that location to save you time, right? Um, my kids used to have really inconvenient swimming lesson time brackets. 
So back then, my spouse would get supper ready in to-go containers and pack it all up, pick me up from work, and on our way up to the swimming lessons, we would start eating. It was just enough time, you know, quick meals, easy meals, that fit in one bowl, little goulashes and craft dinner, that kind of thing. But we would usually have just enough time to finish eating, talk for a little bit, and then go in as a group to get changed, get the kids ready, and move on to their swimming lessons. And, well, it was a very sped up process because we were limited on time. It was better than keeping the kids up afterward uh, because they had got up really early back then too. So we didn't want them uh, being overly tired. But we did find a way to have a family meal. It was in the car, but hey, it works. It was also winter, so that's why it was in the car. The other thing, is, or the next thing rather, is to get your kids involved. Uh, studies have shown that children who are involved in preparing the food are more likely to eat it or to try new things, which I think I actually already mentioned accidentally. Got ahead of my notes, I guess, which is fine. Drive that point home more. Repetition. You can also go ahead and as you start pre-planning your meals as a family, let each person plan one single day. That will give them the opportunity to pick their favorite meal and also kind of, not kind of, you're throwing onto them the responsibility of ensuring the entire family has a well-balanced meal. Work with your kids so that they learn more about those things as they're planning those processes, that additional bit of responsibility can go a long way for helping your kids in life, right? That being said, um, God, I hope I'm not getting sick. It's like the fifth time I've coughed since I got down here. That being said, if your kids all just love craft dinner, and nothing else. We actually have on the Dad's Class YouTube channel a video with five different ways to improve macaroni and cheese. The and perhaps that would inspire you in ways to change up other meals you have on a reoccurring basis and try something new. The next common barrier we have to break down, guys, is the fact that we are well, we're all busy. And a lot of times we feel like we're too tired, too tired to do things. And most of the time that can be true. However, one way to deal with that is delegation. Give everyone one part of the process to take care of. As an example, one person comes up with the meal plan, another person does the shopping, and a third person does the cooking. Obviously, depending on the size of your family or the ages of your children, you might be slightly limited in how or what you can delegate, but there are always going to be some tasks all children can do. Um, if they can walk and stand, you can usually get them to at least hold something for you, so they're part of the process, right? After that, when it comes to your time constraints, keep your meal plan simple and easy. There are ways to make a healthy meal without it being a four hour process. I'm a, a really big fan of goulashes or skillets where you have all your meals in a, or not all your meals, but all of your food groups. Oh, I really have to think about that. All of your food groups in a single meal dish that's pretty healthy you have it all in one go and pretty easy to make sure you get it all by eating it right of course now when all else fails there is the fact that just stocking your pantry or freezer with quick to fix staples and by staples I mean the basic foods that most people eat not the metal ones that hold paper together 
But things such as canned foods or uh, cook from frozen items, just having those there will make it easier for you to start the process of making a meal. So with that, let's talk about how to make shopping easier because that's the next step, right? You, you've planned what you want to eat. You sat down with your family. You made the next, not this week's, but next week's food plan because this week you're just going to do with what you got. But let's say for next week, you guys do you, but uh, here's some ideas. Designate a single day for shopping for your monthly staple foods. Uh, in my hometown here, we have one of the grocery stores does 10% off on the first Tuesday of the month. I believe that's how it works. So that's a great time to go and do your monthly shopping items. Um, pick one day per week to go get fresh items. Uh, most people get their paycheck at the end of the week, and that's usually when they base their shopping for groceries around. Uh, also, most grocery stores do their new flyers starting on Thursdays in preparation for weekend shoppers. So Thursdays or Fridays would work best for that style of shopping to take advantage of the most current deals for fresh foods. As I said, with a fully stocked cupboard or fridge and freezer, whatever you got, if you already have all these things sitting at home, it's a lot easier and actually faster to come home and make a meal than it would be for you to pack up your family and go somewhere else for food. I know sometimes it doesn't really feel like that or seems hard to believe, but as you make this into a habit, it does become easier. Um, six of the other half dozen kind of thing here, but on one train of thought, you have, if everybody has the same job that they do for the family meals, eventually everyone will become so good at their jobs that it will become really efficient. However, because you're an adult and you maybe have children and you're teaching them, you want to also look at the other train of thought, which is if you teach everybody all the jobs, then they all have more skills to draw on. And when you're raising children, that's the way you want to kind of lean with it. So maybe for this month, Bobby's helping with the cooking and Sally's doing all the prep work. And next month they switch. So that they get a good handle on a single skill and then learn something new. And you want to get your kids exposed to a variety of different ways to cook and prepare foods and meals, even if it's potatoes. We uh, we had a whole bunch of potatoes strapped on cash one uh, a couple years ago, and we got the potatoes from my parents' farm, and that was basically all that we had. So we had potato soup, uh, homemade hash browns. We chopped them up ourselves. French fries. We did shredded uh, hash browns. We took shredded hash browns and mashed potatoes, and we made. Uh, potato waffles and potato pancakes and like there are so many things you can do with a bag of potatoes it's insane but for an entire week all of our meals were primarily potato but it was interesting learning all the different ways you could prepare a single potato bonus points to anybody watching on the youtube replay that uh quotes sam from the Lord of the Rings series down there in the comment section. Maybe you're not a shopping veteran. Perhaps you're a young adult who just starting out into the world of your mom's not there to do it for you. And you have no idea what to keep in your house. Or, hell, maybe you got five kids running around and you're still not really sure what to be doing or keeping in your food. Well, luckily for us, this reading has some suggestions. Uh, these suggestions are based off of the Canada Food Guide however, may not apply to everyone based off of their eating preferences, allergies, or anything else. Um, obviously, if you're not into eating meat, the meat portions of this won't really matter to you. But some items that are good to always have on hand are flour, sugar, 
baking powder, baking soda, salt and pepper, uh, butter, cooking oil, a variety of spices, and your basic condiments, which is more than just ketchup and mustard. Condiments actually include things like jams. I learned that today. I never thought of it as a condiment. I just thought of it as jam. Honestly, one of the simplest ways to take something you eat on a regular basis and is to just change it enough to make it interesting um, or a little bit different is to simply find the right combination of spices to add to it. Um, sometimes, I can bear, bear that, sometimes that can backfire terribly uh, if you have no idea what you're doing, but trial and error is kind of a good teacher and the best way to really cook. If you're skeptical about trying a new seasoning or spice, take a small sample of your food, give it the new spices, taste test it before you go and add it to a whole vat of food. Also Google, although it's not always correct, um, you might be able to learn some suggestions for spicing up your foods online. What are those monthly staples I mentioned earlier? Well, those are things like carrots, and they suggest onions in here, but I would be careful about onions. I have bought a lot of onions that were rotten on the inside because they've been in the store for so long. Um, so you may have to buy them a little bit more frequently than once a month. Other things such as potatoes, rice, pasta, or cereals. Also remembering that more, at least half, if not more, of all your grain products should be a whole grain product. Uh, canned food items such as tomatoes, lentils, beans, uh, vegetables or fruits, which can also be of the frozen variety, as well as canned soups. Side note with that, of course, when you're picking items that are canned, look for those which have little or no added fat, sugar, or salt for the healthiest options. Now on to the weekly fresh items. Obviously, fresh fruits and vegetables but where possible, you should try and look for the ones that are actually in season. Uh, they'll typically be at a lower price because they are plentiful in numbers versus those things which may be out of season and will have additional costs attached to them. Then when you go down your dairy aisle, you got your milk, your cheese, your yogurt, and eggs. And then after that, your red meats, fish, and poultry, and lastly, your breads and buns on your weekly shopping list. As a side note, as I do deliver bread for a living, please do not dig for dates. And this doesn't just apply to bread. I mean, unless you're buying bakery fresh bread from your local baker or grocery store, the companies that bring in your bread, such as Dempster's or Wonder Bread here in Canada, are franchisees that are paid entirely based off of commission sales. So when a product is removed from a store, uh, that leads to a loss for the person's family financially. If it didn't sell from the store, if they take it back as a stale product or a near stale product, Sure, your bread lasted you five days at home every time you bought it, but little Susie's going to go without shoes for the new school year. You know, just something to think about. Um, many places will actually have clearance sections for near expiry dated products, not all, and not for every type of product. I know Walmart here has near dates for veggie trays, fruits and stuff. Um... No Frills usually has a near date or no plano, things that don't have a spot on the shelf anymore. They put on clearance to get rid of them. You just have to kind of look around the stores. Um, Walmart does clearance on other things, but not so much the breads, I've noticed. For their breads that they make in their bakery, yes, but not so much for other things. Uh, field stores here in Canada, they get the near date bread from Canada bread if you have a field store so it has less of a shelf life but um, you can get basically any kind of bread for like a buck 70 it's really cheap so something to look into if you're looking to 
save some money, you know you're going to go through a lot of bread in a short period of time. So a big part of eating together as a family is definitely the planning aspect of it. And like most things in life, the more planning we put into it initially, the easier it will become to execute it afterwards. So let's say you've done all of your planning. Uh, you got all your earlier scheduling done and now you're looking at, well, how do I make sure this follows through? Like, what are some, some tips, right? Well, I have 10 tips for you guys. 10 tips for top family meals. Straight out of the reading, I moderately modified a few of the sentences, but uh, trying to achieve four or more family meals each week. And when you think about the fact that there's seven days in a week, three meals a day, like four is a pretty small number. I can't do head math. Don't even look at me for that ever. <laughs> but four meals, even if you had out of seven days, you only sat down for four breakfasts. That's three. You didn't have to, right? Like it's not, it's not a terribly high number. And, but just remember that they can be any meal in the day. Just sit down as a family and enjoy that time together. Number two, make your family meals the priority, not the things happening before or after them and not other ways of getting through meals. Focus on the meal time. Number three, keep a sense of humor. Have fun with it, guys. It's not supposed to be um, military school. It's, it's your house. Just chill. It's okay to cook it quickly, but... Eat it slow, you know, enjoy the time with your family at family meal time. Do your best to keep the conversation happy and relaxed. Obviously there's always gonna be disagreements between siblings and stuff, but deal with it, move on, and change the subject if you have to or whatever the case may be. When time is an issue because of an impending thing keep it simple you know just do wraps or a uh, salad something like that then always plan and cook together we've already discussed in this how doing that is better for your kids in a variety of different ways so just do it as a family do it as a group and if you're not to the stage where you have family yet, um, another thing that you can do is actually get together with a couple of friends and do the same thing. Even if you don't live in the same part of town, Bob lives on the north end, you live on the south end. Alternate and once a month get together and uh, cook large quantities so that you, both households will have multiple meals for a month, you know, stick it in the freezer or whatever. That's something you can do. If you're not with your own family, cook with friends. Uh, prepare the same meal for every member of the household, trying to include at least one item each person likes. Turn off all technology. Maybe some ambient music in the background to set the mood. But even that can be a distraction. So just turn off technology. Focus on your family. Or your family meals. The other meals, who cares? Let each individual decide the quantity of food they will eat. Now when it comes to point number eight, there are obviously allergies or food preferences such as vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians, and all the other Tarians aren't considered in that statement of making sure everybody gets the same food, but yeah. And with number 10, within reason, I know with our oldest boy, the type of medication he is on, it makes, he doesn't realize that he's hungry. It takes away that hunger response from his body as one of the side effects. 
So he rarely feels all that hungry and often just feels like he doesn't really want to eat. So when it comes to his meal sizes, we're very strict on ensuring he gets a certain amount of food because he needs to be gaining a certain amount of weight to be healthy for his medication. So like with most things and pretty much everything I'll share with you guys here on the podcast, these are just general comments and suggestions. So take what you need from it. Only add to your toolbox the tools you're missing or the tools you want to try, right? And then be sure to answer this week's question. What things will you do differently with regards to your meals and planning after this episode? Hey, if you're not going to be changing anything and you think I just wasted your time, let me know about that too. I'm okay with it. Uh, As always, guys, you can get in touch with me via Twitter or email with Crown S O C R O W N E S S zero at gmail.com for the emailers. And as always, down below the bridge where all the trolls live, if you're on the comment section for YouTube. Those are the same ways you guys can get in touch with me if you would like to come on as a guest to speak about a certain topic or if you'd like to talk to me about becoming a regular co-host on the show. Have a great night, everybody. Unless, of course, you're watching on the YouTube replay later and then I'll put like a link here to that five ways to make craft dinner better and also to a playlist here from my family's geocaching channel where me and the kids and the wife made a bunch of food together. Because cooking together is important, and that totally ties into today's subject. So, go check it out. One of those, right there. That one, or this one, or that one. This one, that one, this one, that one, this one, that one, this one. Just do both. Have a good night, guys.